Heather McDonald has got the juices scoop. When you're on the road, when you're on the go, Juicy Scoop is the show to know. She talks Hollywood tales, her real life Mr. Segment serial data, and serial sister. You'll be addicted and addicted fast to the number one tabloid real life podcast. Listen in, listen up. Woo woo. Heather McDonald. Juicy Scoop. Hello and welcome to Juicy Scoop. If you're watching on YouTube, I hope you're subscribing and sharing, but you're also seeing I'm wearing this adorable tank top that the girls of the Juicy Scoop OC sorority chapter gifted me. That's right. Many years ago when I started Juicy Scoop, I also started a fun thing I thought would be cool for Juicy Scoopers in different cities to kind of create their own sorority. And the Alpha chapter is OC. And I'm excited because I'm going to come see these girls at the Irvine Improv. Once again, it is one of my favorite places to perform. I will be there August 4th and 5th, that's Friday and Saturday, two shows a night of stand-up, and then on Sunday, August 6th, I am doing a live Juicy Scoop. That's where the juiciest stuff is heard and seen, but only there. That's right, and it's going to include the hilarious Brandy and Julie, along with some other special guests. So you go there to heathermcdonald.net and go get those tickets. Okay, you guys, we've talked about this earlier. I did a TikTok about it. I just want to fill you in. There was a very disturbing story about this young woman named Carly Russell. She was a nursing student and she called the police and said, oh my God, I'm driving down this highway and I see a child who looks to be about four, year old, four years old in a diaper pulled over. The phone was dropped. She went missing. They went to go and nothing but her wig and her um, car and her, I think her purse, but nothing else was there. No child to be found, no child seen on the surveillance camera. A couple days later, she was found safe. At that point, the parents said, please, we want to have our privacy. The boyfriend said she fought kidnappers, you know, with every inch of her for her life. Thank God she's safe. People started swirling around. This seems a little fishy. Seems a little fishy. Other people very afraid to say it seems fishy, but I thought it was fishy and I talked about it last week. Well, now the um, authorities are coming forward and saying they found some interesting things about the story. The good news is they said, no one needs to worry. We don't believe a kidnapper is on the loose. Also, don't worry. There's no missing four-year-old child that's being used as a lure to kidnap people or is running the highway alone. What they did find is that after she left her nursing job, she left with a robe and some toilet paper on a surveillance camera from her work. She then went to Target and bought some um, Cheez-Its and some granola bars. Those Cheez-Its and granola bars were not found in her car, even though that was the last place she left, when she was supposedly kidnapped. So then she said, uh, this guy with red hair and a bald spot on his head dragged me when I was trying to help the child, drag me from behind. And then I woke up and I was like in this trailer with a ma- with that man and another woman who forced me to undress and take photos of me. And at some point I was able to escape and got home safe. They also said she Googled things like the movie Taken, if you have to pay for an Amber Alert, other things about missing people and kidnappings. So um, yeah, it doesn't look good. We're happy it's this didn't happen. We're happy that she's safe. We're happy that these people don't exist. We're happy that this child didn't exist. Um, why did she do it? You know, was it, it was obviously sort of planned at this point. And um, it'll be kind of, I wonder if she'll ever cop to it. You know, with the other story of the girl that supposedly went missing jogging, left her two kids and husband for almost a whole month that was with her boyfriend or old boyfriend, whatever, she got convicted and she has, I think she's doing some time now, but we never really know knew why. Like she never said, okay, I'm ready to do my interview on Juicy Scoop and tell you exactly why I did it, why I sought out the attention, why I planned it out, why we don't, we still don't, we really haven't heard from her except that, oh, I guess I'm sorry. Now I'm going to go do some time. So I don't know why people do this. But fake kidnappings, 
have always been a thing, just like fake pregnancies, fake divorces, all of it, it happens. So Erica Jane, remember the diamond earrings? Well, she was ordered by the court to give these $750,000 earrings up. They went on auction and Ronald Richards, who's very involved in this case and loves to tweet about it, he bought them. Well, she appealed it. She said, these were a gift to me and they're mine. And even though the money was taken out of an escrow account that wasn't supposed to be used for personal goods, I don't know. They should still be mine. I don't know why I have to give them back. Anyway, she won her appeal. So they said, I don't know where we are in the case right now, but those earrings might be coming back and that might be awkward for Ronald Richards. Oh my God, the sister wife trailer came out. I'm not exactly sure when the actual date comes, but I'm telling you, I'm so excited. Sister Wives is about Cody and his four wives. I've watched it forever. I can't stop watching it. He um, is down to one wife and we get to see how he got there, okay? And we know that Janelle, we already saw... I'm sorry. We know that Christine already left him. She's already engaged to someone else. She's celebrating with a tattoo. Um, I believe uh, one of her daughters just got married to a woman, and she's thrilled. Then we have Janelle. And Janelle, um, we're going to see her say to the F you, Cody, shut your effing face. We've never seen anything like it. Um, I guess I'll have to bleep it out because it's TLC. I feel like I got to see the full F word on the trailer. We know she is out. Mary, who he's wanted to be gone, wife number uh, one. She has one daughter who now is living um, as a, I think, a non-binary or a man. And that that person has now become like Lion or something. The name is Lion. Anyway. I don't know. I think they her child has gotten married as well. Um, but at the the other girl's wedding, we saw that Cody went. Anyway, we are down to one wife, Robin. That is it. And she's there in the trailer crying with no tears coming down saying, I got into this life because I imagined sitting on my porch being old. Watching my kids and grandkids with my sister wives. And now it's just me and Cody. That's right. It's just you and Cody. It And he is like, I am not a happy camper. And his perm is going and his curls are fluttering. I cannot wait. Um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, you guys. Uh, they got a, it's, as you know, it's a, a movie. It's that we all loved. It was a cartoon from Disney. It's 87 years old, this cartoon. It is now being made into a live action movie to come out in 2024. Snow White um, is this girl, Rachel, Rachel Zieg Ziegler. She's Hispanic actress. Rachel Ziegler is Snow White. She's very pretty. But the thing that people are up in arms about is that the dwarfs are not seven men, little men, that she is living with and cleaning up and cooking for. They wanted to bring it up to date. So it's all different genders, sizes. They're not all little people. They um, are not all the same ethnicity and people are not happy about it. Let me, let me find that photo. Here we go. Um, I have a photo of them here. They're men, they have long hair. They're wearing you know mismatched outfits and stuff. And I guess they still have to hi-ho, hi-ho, off to work we go because it looks like they're going to work in this photo. But Game of Thrones, Peter Dinklage, he is not happy. He says um, he criticized the film early for their portrayal of the disability. He said, you're progressive, you're progressive in one way, but then you're still making um, that fucking backward story about seven dwarves living in a cave together. What the fuck are you doing, man? Have I done nothing to advance the cause of my soapbox? I guess I'm not loud enough. <clears throat> Except he didn't, I think there's only like one dwarf in the whole thing. So then if you're a dwarf or a little person, then you're bitter because, you know, there's finally a movie you can be in and they don't use you. 
They are like, we only want one of you. And you're like, what about six of my friends? And they're like, no, just one. I mean, that's what the photo looks like. It's just one. And, you know, then I'm like, well, are they going to keep the names? And the article didn't say if they're going to keep the names. Because Dopey, that's not appropriate anymore with, you know, opiate epidemic and fentanyl to call someone Dopey. Sleepy, you know, some people have a problem with sleep or sleeping too much. Grumpy. Maybe they need a mental health day. Bashful, maybe they're just an introvert, you know, and you should leave them alone. Happy, well, there's a toxic positivity. That's not cool. So it's not cool that you're happy all the time. And then there's sneezy. We should not make fun of people with allergies. So I don't know how they're going to do that because anyone that makes fun of people being allergic to anything or sneezing, that's rude. And then there's doc. One person got an education and is a doctor, but has to go be with these other weird people. And um, so anyway, I I think it looks like it'll be kind of fun. I like talking about it. She's pretty. Crystal Hefner has a book coming out. I mentioned it, but I know a little bit more about it. She said that she had to go, um, she had to go and underwent deprogramming after leaving Playboy Mansion. She came here to L.A. when she was 21. That's when she also met Hugh, who was 81 at the time. And then she married him at 26 after five fun years of dating. She said, when you're in a place where you could easily be replaced, you're always kind of on guard. It's hard to make friends. So she didn't make friends in the Playboy Mansion. It was hard. She had a 10-year relationship with him before he died. And um, she really buried who she was before she had to bury him. And he... She had a 6 p.m. curfew, and um, she felt she felt that she gave herself to just a needy man who made her feel guilty for leaving. And she said, um, at first, Crystal said she thought, wow, I finally belong somewhere, and I'm important by association, but I'm still important. Yeah, it feels good. It didn't take long, though, before the facade and everything kind of unraveled. And she had to watch those movies, those Casablanca-type movies, and she said, oh, Hef loved the old movies where the women were just fainting and helpless. And they could do nothing without a man and then ask a man for everything. She said, adding that she was rewarded for being helpless like a damsel, and as he got older, Hefter just got more needy and dependent on me. Oh, I don't know why you thought that. I, I, did you think when you were 21 and he was 81 and then you married him when he was 87 and you were 26, did you think that he wouldn't need you? I mean, the guy is 90. You didn't think he would need you? He needed you. Um, anyway, she said Hef was a narcissist, you think? Misogynist? Shocking. And he was very complicated human, but he also did a lot of good. He helped a lot of people. He stood up for a lot of things too. Okay. Anyway, she got her... Um, her boobs taken out, and she only kept one bunny outfit. And um, so I am excited to read her book. Ha- Crystal, I'd love for you to come on the show. Come on, tell me everything. People that are uh, close to Kim Zolziak are allegedly pissed that she called off the divorce. You know, when you drag all your friends in and you bitch about your man and everything, and they're all working around you. Oh my God, get away from this monster who doesn't have a job, who's not yourself. You see, he's telling the cops he's crazy. They're, according to Radar Online, they're like annoyed. They're like, what the hell? We feel like used and duped that now you're staying with him. And that's what happens, guys. If whether you're the one that trauma dumped on your friend about your man and then you go back to your man, or you're the one that was there to help your friend, you also got to say to yourself, if my friend goes back to this guy, am I am I going to be okay with it? Am I going to still support him? Am I still going to smile and bring over a potato salad six months from now when they have a barbecue, even though she was out my house crying, telling me every horrible, awful thing he did and said? Can you be that person? Can you be that friend? Maybe you can. Maybe you can't. You know, you got to think about it. But they're together. A lot of people were very scared about this Lisa Rinna look. She had one of her wigs on. And they made her eyebrows kind of light, like a blonde. So that really kind of changed your look when you like light out your eyebrows. Very, And her lips looked so huge. People were dying. They said that she looked like Brandy Glanville. They thought she looked like Steven Tyler. Whatever. It was just a fashion look. And she has full lips and they overdrew them. And then they, you know, bleached her brows. Relax, people. I 
This is sad news. This is Nene Leak's older son, Bryson. He's 33, and he was arrested. There was um, a call that came in. They found him, like, sitting on the lawn of some house that wasn't his. They looked into his car, according to the police report, and they found a small baggie. They thought it was either cocaine or fentanyl. It turns out it is fentanyl, and he was arrested, and... Um, you know, it's very sad. And he also said when asked that he was his, he said, uh, he didn't say his name was Bryce. And he said his name was his younger brothers, who is her younger son. This is her older son, younger son. And um, I believe he's a dad too. So this is all, this is all just a real bummer for her. But he's, um, she said, he's had an easy life, Nene said this. So now I'm going to show him what hard life is. He's going to stay in jail. I'm not getting him out and he can figure it out from behind bars. So he has a scheduled hearing. You know, it, it appears he wasn't selling it. It just appears he might have possibly been using it. I hope not, but that's a bummer. Um, Mindy Kaling is speaking out about her weight loss and I'm kind of glad she is. She was doing something, uh, an interview, and she just said, I'm done talking about my weight and people taking it so personally. I have talked about this before. She looks great. Um, yeah, does she look a lot better than 10 years ago when you watch a rerun of um, The Office? Yeah, she's thinner. She's fit. She's 10 years older. She has a lot more money. There's been a lot of advances in plastic surgery and skincare and everything else, and Money makes you look a little better. So, yeah, she looks great. I don't like that people don't like it. What's the What the hell is the problem? She also says she um, – basically, she does 20 miles a week of either hiking or running. She's made fitness part of her life for the, couple, for the last couple of years, and she doesn't do a diet. She just eats less. Whether she used Ozempic or something else, who cares? She's maintaining it. She looks good, and she is working out, and she's fit. And I've said this before – this this is the thing of people just always talking. They're either saying, eat something, you're too thin. Then now that this whole body positivity thing happens, being like, just be happy with the body you're in. If those women then choose to lose weight and look great, it's like this whole group of other people are like, we lost an ally. Why did you have to conform to go to the other side? It's like, why do you care what somebody's doing with their own body? Let them be healthy. The same thing if somebody gains a few pounds. Leave them the hell alone. But yeah, people being so angry about how they got to be the size that they are, it's really none of your business. Let it go. Um, don't, you know, and I think there's another thing where there's skinny privilege where someone who's been skinny their whole life or unfortunately had to starve themselves or have eating disorders and never, and they, they didn't enjoy the tiramisu at night and they didn't get to have bread for the last 30 years. They're not happy about the Ozempic people either because they're like, God, if I only had that for the last 40 years. And now my friend is like better looking than me because she always had a prettier face, but at least I was thin. Now I'm still not that cute and thin and she's gorgeous and thin. That's what it is. Women don't always support each other, you guys. Very sad. As Ramona would say, you know what? You know what? Not all, all women support women, okay? You know what? A lot of people don't support everybody, okay? Really? You know, just like I said, Bethany, she doesn't support everybody. She's acting like she's supporting Jill. She's acting like she's really supportive of the people. But I know the real Bethany. Okay, so, all right, you guys. Remember to go to heathermcdonald.net for the rest of my dates. Irvine Improv, Red Bank, New Jersey, Foxwood Casino, um, Huntington, New York, West Hampton Beach Theater. Oh, my God. All of it's coming. I'm coming to New York for you. So excited. And now for a really great interview about a juicy story. This book, I predict, will become a movie. It is it's about fashion. It's about sex. It's a, a little culty. It's a time of L.A. life that was popping. Please get ready for a juicy interview with the author, Kate Flannery, and the book is Strip Tease. Hello and welcome to Juicy Scoop. Today, I have a juicy book with the author, Kate Flannery, not to be confused with the redhead Kate from The Office. This is a book called Strip Tease about the American apparel juice. Welcome, Kate, to the show. This is your first novel. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. So 
you know, I I remember this time. It wasn't a look I was into. It was like the early 2000s, and it just kind of took over. And it, and there's also a scandal with the owner and all of that. And so the book starts out, and it's kind of how you – it's your memoir. So kind of how you got involved in this fashion world, how you got the job. So let's just get into it. T- tell us a little bit about yourself before – since it's your memoir, like how did you get into get to LA, all of that? Sure. Well, I grew up in kind of a little hillbilly town. I say that with love in Pennsylvania, and you know it was sort of nearby Philly in New York, and I could sort of like taste glamour and adventure and an exciting life in fashion. And once I went to college, and I've always been a writer, so I studied writing. I really I got a job in Philadelphia for a year working for Urban Outfitters in their headquarters, and I sort of had. You know, it really um, broke a lot of my illusions about what working in fashion was going to be. Mm -hmm. A lot of things were made in in sweatshops. My boss was kind of stodgy. You know, I was working in a cubicle. I was writing all their catalogs and the text on their website. And I was like, there's got to be something better than this. It was 2004. California was having a moment, you know, like the simple life, the OC. It's so funny to like to read people talk about that. And right now there's like all these documentaries about the early 2000s. And I'm like, oh, so I was here and I didn't realize like this is a hot thing that's happening. I'm like, I've just lived here my whole life. I was like, all right. But yeah, yeah. it was kind of the 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 launch of reality TV totally. with the girls next door and the simple life and the Paris Hilton. And with Paris Hilton kind of came the MySpace and kind of this is where it began where you could brag about yourself, which I always say is was not like when I was growing in high school. It was, it was the worst thing to be conceited. But this was like I'm yes. cute. You're cute. That's Let's so be cute together. Let's post about how fabulous we are and tell the world how fabulous we are. And like, it wasn't anything to be sh- ashamed of. No. And yeah. even further than that, it was cool to have a celebrity sex tape. It was cool to have a Playboy spread. Oh, yeah. Playboy. You know? yeah. So a company like American Apparel, this sexy, uh, you know, I, I had no misgivings about it because it just seemed like we were in this post 9-11, post feminist world where like Gloria Steinem had taken care of that. Like we could be sexy and own our sexiness. And also Sex in the City oh, uh, was yes. just starting, <sighs> yes. which I, I remember driving on Sunset and seeing Sex and the City, and I couldn't believe that was a title. <laughs> I was yeah, like, was, what is this? Yeah. You know? And, you know, so that that is really it's interesting. True. When they you really think of were it like the that. mothers of all that. Yeah. It, what seemed so shocking back then is now, right. I mean, kind of pale. Yeah. And so, um, so when you got the job, because you met these girls at a bar and they just like approach you. Yes. And what did you think of that? Did you think it was like a weird, (laughs) scary thing or you just thought it was safe? Well, I moved to L.A. on sort of a whim and I had a very small savings left over from Urban and I needed a job right away. So when these fashionable, beautiful young women were like, hey, they just hand me this card. Come join our team. We work for this incredible company. You know, it's not like any other company. It's not like Urban Outfitters. It's not like those companies that use sweatshops to run things like this is a cool company. And they were so cool. And I was lonely. And it just was perfect. I went with them without a second thought and, you know, started my adventure. So they had these – it was in, like, downtown L.A. or where was it? was at Little Joy in Echo Park. Pre-renovation Little Joy. It was, like, real grungy and fabulous. And what was your position there? Um, I – I was feeling really full of myself because I had this fancy writing degree. I had just had this writing job. And they were like, want to work in the store, the first American Apparel store? And I was, you know, like, oh, we're back to retail. You know, I'd like done that in high school. Yeah. Um, but they convinced me, do this job and you will move on to other things, bigger and better things. This company is expanding. And wait till you meet the founder, this charismatic, problematic, I would find, um, very... What's his name? Dove Charney. Okay. Dove Charney. And um, it all just sounded so good. And I went to the factory. They told me to come to the factory, which is in downtown LA, where yeah. everything was made. And um, then I really got started. And so how did the guy, Dove, come up with this and that it was profitable by making these clothes in America? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's so simple, but it's ingenious. You know, when you're dealing with a sweatshop... If you want, if something doesn't have the right collar or there's some problem, it's not the right color, you have to wait for weeks for a message to get over there, to stop production. 
if you're making everything downstairs, you just go downstairs and say, hold up, we're switching things. You, you can change, you have such a, a, a finger on the pulse of your chain of supply and demand. So it was very easy to turn a ridiculous profit when you're not waiting uh, for, um, you know, to hear from Bangladesh or whatever. What do you think of, um, just to jump gears a little, of the whole sheen, fast fashion oh and the influencers. What are your thoughts on that? That's so fascinating, That the video of them going to the factory. And saying how great it is yes, and everything. I know. I, I, I just think they were maybe a little innocent. Like I am in striptease, um, um, it seems a little too good to be true. I mean, if you've never been to a factory before, um, you know, you don't really know what to expect. Because uh, with the sheen, it's like... I mean, I've seen so many things, and you don't know what is totally true. What it did was this video on TikTok manipulated, and whatever. Yeah. But it, you know, I believe that there have been people that have gotten an item from certain oh. designers, maybe not Sheen, maybe other ones, where in the label where it would say "dry clean only" or whatever, mm-hmm. they're writing like "please help me" yeah. or typing out oh gosh, things absolutely. like that. Absolutely, it's it's really awful. That's why the draw to work at a place that was made in America, where you can see the employees, they're they're getting massages at the end of their shifts, they're getting fair wages, they're getting English lessons, they're being able to support their families in a way and, and have a job with dignity and, and be treated with respect. Um, you know, I still stand behind that business model. I still, I, I still find myself buying things from Los Angeles Apparel because I know that factory is doing it the right way. And so the look was kind of, and the ads were very provocative. They looked very 1976 porn, young girl, Mm -hmm. like like not really done makeup, like a greasy face. Yeah, you got it. A tank with no bra, Mm -hmm. you know, like kind of like barely 18 kind of a look. Mm -hmm. And that, but that caught the eye of things. What did you think of that? Were you all down for that at the beginning or did you think it was a little creep? You know, I was... I was 23 when I started. So they were my people. I mm-hmm. I thought it was sort of infantilizing to think that these girls that were not only in the ads, but running the company, making all of the decisions. So the models worked on the show. Oh, yeah. yeah. American and it Apparel wasn't girls. your typical models, which now we see a lot mm-hmm. not typical. Now it's like, you know, everything but like a traditional 90s looking model is like what we see on the Target ads and stuff. Yeah. But then it was kind of like, you just feel like you were like looking at some average person alone in their bedroom before they like yeah. took a shower. Yeah, it's like a it was like Instagram. a little bit. It was a little bit. Yeah, it was a little bit weird, but it was definitely like intriguing because it was so different than what we saw at you know Old Navy and the Gap and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the reason was because those shots are real; they're not posed. You know. Um, the founder was in a lot of relationships with these girls. So let's so. get into that. How did that happen? And, and so was he, how did he get into and get his funding and stuff to start to do this? Oh my gosh, he, it, it's, it is impressive. He, he dropped out of college. He had such a passion. He's Canadian. Mm-hmm. He's such a passion for t-shirt making. He went to, I think it was North Carolina to like learn how to make t-shirts. He learned how to make the best kind of T-shirts. This was in, you know, in the 90s when it was still like boxy T-shirts, which are kind of back in again now. But it was really hard to find like a really cute, fitted, like Euro style T-shirt back then. Mm -hmm. And those were the ones he wanted to make. Um, And he he started a company. I forget what it was called, but it went bankrupt. And then he did it again with American Apparel and succeeded wildly. Moved to L.A., got the factory and and started there. Um, And... You know, he um, – I'm trying to get into the uh, – like his girlfriends. Okay, get into it. <laughs> <laughs> what you can share, yeah. Well, you know, when I first got there, I I didn't put two and two together. But um, really, very quickly in one of my first months of work, or maybe a couple months in, I was in there working the floor <laughs> – and, um, of the store or the factory? Of the store. Okay. Of the first Echo Park store, which I, I really had to run for myself by myself for a while. It was really early in the company. We were like wearing yeah. lots of hats. And I see like the dressing room curtain moving. And I, I knew no one was in the store. So I'm like, who is in there? What d- Did I miss something? Do they need help? I'm like going over. Do you need another size? No, it's Dove Charney, and he is in the throes of a passionate affair with my with my friend, my one of the girls who was in all the ads. 
And, and um, why is it an affair? Because he had a wife or a Oh, girlfriend? no, 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 no. I just mean like oh. they're making out hot and heavy. Oh, they're making out. No, no, no. Wasn't he's not the bone. commitment type yeah. okay. at all. Yeah. Okay, so no. she's getting down with him. Okay. Yes. They were in all their clothes, just... Yeah, and making out like I had never seen anything like it, even to this day. So it, you mean you opened the curtain and saw it, and then it was like, oh shit. Yes. Okay. And he was like, it's okay. How can I blame you for wanting to watch two people getting it on? Like I was spying on him. I was Ew. like, oh my god, no, that's not what was going on. I should have known right, right yeah. then. Yeah. Um, and it's funny when I talked to the girl who her name is Carolee in the book. Um, I told you know I, I braced her. These are all of the things I'm writing about. And I said to her, do you remember the day I met you or I, I met Dove in, yeah. the, in the dressing room? And she was like, no, which is so funny. That's like such a thing in memoir. The things that are so important to you, like how could I ever forget that? To her, that was just another day. She didn't even remember that. But she was like, "Yeah, were we naked? I'm like, oh, God. Okay, now, so this has obviously now, happened how before. How was she? You said you were how old at this time? Um, I, was, I was one of the older women there okay. at 23. I'd say she was probably 19. She was, And how old was he? 33, maybe. 33. Mm, that's pretty creep. Yeah. 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 And so... And at the helm of... And her boss. Yeah. And a millionaire. It's just the power and balance. It and can be you, consensual, so but that did power Did he have balance. like a sick pad and invite you guys over for like work oh, pool yeah. parties or anything? Mm. Eventually he did. Yeah. First he started out in a very humble bungalow. And okay. then he bought this glorious deco mansion, which I call the big house. There's a chapter in Striptease, the juiciest one of all, called okay. The Big House. Okay. Where I went over there for dinner one night. One of his girlfriends was in a jealous snit because he was doing a photo shoot with another girl, which would happen, you know, all the time. Um, and afterwards when I left, the story got back to me that she – <laughs> went to the bottom of the staircase of this beautiful house, got in her car, and drove all the way up and up the stairs of the house to with the very the, top. With, in her company, Mercedes. So she crashed open the door? Wait, she, no, she couldn't get to... It's a very big staircase. She got pretty far up so that she, staircase. She did a Betty Broderick where she went <laughs> in the front exactly. of the house? <laughs> and yes. You, and there were people there or yes. no people were there? Oh yeah, there were lots of people there doing the photo shoot. There was even a journalist there on the on the sidelines. And what was she arrested? What happened? No, of course not. She's a prized girlfriend. So he just was like, Ugh. he was very. He didn't want that news to get around. When he found out that people were talking about it, he was like angry. Um, but the funny thing is, then it happened again. The, the <laughs> so girl, how much? You mean the same girl tried to drive yes. in up the yes. stairway of the house? Yes, that's what I've heard. Yes, she broke down the front door again. Yes. It's confirmed in podcasts and stuff. It's it's like lore, but it's it happened. It's true. So is this? So was it sort of like a Hugh Hefner in that all these girls knew they were not exclusive, but they were kind of vying for the yes. number one or even two spot yes. at that point? Except that Hugh Hefner to me just has these like crusty old grandpa vibes. Yes, and like Dove, well, he was a crusty old yeah, grandpa. Yeah, like just like even the way the mansion looked. Like, oh, so dated like, in the waterbed and oh, the wood. Yeah, yeah, but like. Dove was hip and young, and yes, he was 33, and we were young. Still, that's young. Though. Yeah, I, it, now it seems young. To me, I was like, oh, that's old. I could never, like, 30-year-old, right, right. oh, my God. Um, but yes, he was so young and charismatic. Like, you wanted to be with him. Like, thank God I wasn't his type, because, you know, who knows how I could have gotten sucked in. So did you do the ads? Oh, yeah. So did you get paid extra for the ads? No, of course not. See, that's insane. I know. Well, one of the things in the Playboy Mansion, um, the Playboy documentary, mm -hmm. was how they would, you know, hey, you're going to do Playboy and you're going to get paid whatever. Even for the people that got paid a lot for the shoot. Really, the people that only got paid really a lot were if you um, – were like a celebrity or you were a returning playmate. But even if you were like the month or whatever, it wasn't like life-changing money. No. But then what they would do is they would take all these, all the photos and, you know, you take a bunch of show photos and use four of them. All of those, they signed something that they could use forever. So then when online playmate stuff was able to happen later on in the 90s, some woman that took the, sh the that did the shoot in the 80s. Yes. Is her photos are being used and made profitable and all this stuff for forever. Yeah. And so I think that's so weird that you're here you are folding t-shirts mm -hmm. and your photo like did you ever have an ad that was like 
in magazines and yes. stuff like that. I was in the storefront, a huge video screen of me dancing um, in the Paris American Apparel down the street from Pompidou Center. And did anybody say we they should They didn't even be- tell me about it. I found out because someone was like, another worker from France was in town. And she was like, oh, it's you. And I, I thought, what? They were like, oh, yeah, we put that video of you dancing in France. And my roommate was like, did you get paid? I was like, no, I was So working. your roommate did ask. So you guys were like savvy enough to be like, Look, I still really love my job, and it's fun, and it is kind of cool. But at yeah. the same time, you were aware that you were. Well, he t- was being... an outsider. He didn't work for the company, and I was so deep in that cult that any who, who criticism. He didn't work for the company. Oh, my roommate at the oh, time. Oh, your roommate. He was like a friend who came over from Philly. Oh, with so me. he didn't. Yeah, so he was just. I got the... rid of him fast. I was like, he's he's the voice of reason. He's trying to tell me that my job isn't perfect. He's trying to tell me I'm being exploited by this company that I love. I was like, I'm getting my own place. But really, he's a great guy. (laughs) So you do mention in the book that, you know, you kind of realize, am I in a cult? Yeah. Okay, so tell me a little bit about when you started to, the things that led you to that, that are cult-like. Once I went on salary, which should have been this really exciting thing. Um, so now are you still working in the store or no? I'm still working in the stores, but okay. I'm recruiting. Okay. I'm flying. Every time there's a new store, um, I'm flying there to hire, hire people. all the girls. And so then you were also hiring based on looks, style. Can you vibe with the store? Very Amber Crombie and Finch. Yes, absolutely. And I also had a friend who worked for a major retailer. Um, guess what it is. And... <laughs> <laughs> And I remember I went and hung out with her in Hawaii because she was like, I have a room. You have to be gone all day because all day I'm going to be interviewing girls to work at the new stores. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she she was a, a gorgeous girl, too, but she had a great sense of style. And, yeah, you were hiring based on the look and the image and everything. I mean, now I guess that would be a big no, no. But I mean. You still see it. You, no matter what store you go to, whether it's like a Louis Vuitton or whatever, there's a certain kind of person. Well, thank God it's not about ethnicity anymore. But still, whether they're black, uh, Asian, white, they have a style about mm-hmm. them. They have a snobbery about them. You know, there's yeah. a certain vibe that you get yes. that goes with the look of the store, sure. you know. Um Okay, so continue what you're saying. So, so you're having this fun time. You're doing these things, and I'm you're re- flying. I'm jet setting around. You're recruiting these girls, yes. and yes. in recruiting them, then would he dove come around and and hit on them? And did you ever feel any guilt when they get sucked into a romance with him? For sure, that's like the climax of striptease. It's yeah. really, um, it's funny. That was when I was recording the audiobook. Um, I just, it surprised me when I hit that subject matter that that was like the hardest one to read. There's other kind of crazier stuff that happens. Yeah. Um, that, but that, yeah, it's it's in striptease. That's, you'll see. Right. No, I, don't, I still want everyone to read the book, but <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. I could see that where, and then you're kind of like, oh, I didn't even like realize, like you didn't really necessarily think, yes, I'm going to bring in this girl because this is Dove's type. No, you're just never. like, no, I'm going to get these girls because this is the look. They're fun and they also seem like, they're going to show up on Tuesday. Yes, yeah. for sure. In the very beginning, um, when I started recruiting, Dove would have to approve every image. You know, I had my trusty Polaroid camera, and every Polaroid would be sent to the factory. Um, after, you know, after I had a few stores under my belt, I stopped having to do that. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I just sort of started to sink in deeper and deeper. Um, things started happening like I was you know, I would go on vacation with my family and I'd get a call from the factory. You got to go to this struggling store. And yeah. I would think I would explain everything away. You know, oh, I uh, it's a job that only I can do. You know, I'm just so important at this company. Right. Um, and then, you know, I come from this really feminist Bryn Mawr background. S- when the sexual harassment starts started mounting, the sexual harassment lawsuit started mounting. When I was at the big house and someone told me that one of the girls from Japan who works for the company, not only works for the company, but is also Dove's geisha and like comes in and... and so wait, he had a real geisha? Yes. What is That's a, my... Yeah. What is a real geisha? Like, what is the deal? Because like, I remember that book that was so famous. Yes, yes. And it was... And then I recently talked to somebody and... She was like, you know, this other girl we met, she was a geisha for a while. Then she had to become a realtor. (laughs) (laughs) 
I hate when that I mean, happens. Wait a minute. She's like a girl from Newport Beach, and she's beautiful, and she's blonde and beautiful yes. today. But I go, what do you mean? And she's like, no, she seriously went to Japan. And like, and I go, but do what do the geishas do? Do they screw or do they just like make tea and be like bound yeah. their feet? What is it? I, I'm not sure specifically, but I do know that this geisha wandered into the room while a sex like, act was the, being performed. With the wig <laughs> I don't, and makeup? I don't think so. No. Oh, oh okay. no. Okay. But came in with a little tray. There were some glasses of water, a little bowl with ice cubes, and she leaned over to Dove and my friend and you know, wiped the sweat from their brow and gave As them they're water. Fucking. Yes. Yes. So once I heard a you, story you like that. You witnessed it or you heard it? I heard okay, it. Okay, I okay. heard it from the girl. The gay girl. Who's, no. From oh, the, the girl, girl that was screwing. Yes. And so she was like, this was freaking weird. Or was she like, oh, it was kind of nice because I was a little sweaty and I did want a sip of yeah. tea. No, it was like a, a funny <laughs> joke to her. Oh. Whereas really at this point in the story, I'm disgusted. Just the how, how ugly many and racist do you think, it is. Yes. And how many people do you think he was like screwing oh. out of time? Oh, my God. Well, that's the thing. You know, mostly all of the girls in here are very supportive except for one. She's like, everybody's going to know it's me and you told my stories. But I want to say to her, there were hundreds of girls. Like, I just think it hurts maybe to read this later. And that's really the issue um, because I write about her with such love. I, I really care for her. Um, the girl that. Yeah, the, the girl's the mad at me. Okay. Yeah, and she's the one in the gay shit. You know, she's... Yeah. Well, this is juicy. Yeah. She, um, I gave her... I told I told her what was in the book. Yeah. I took her to Coachella to see Bjork in front of the stage. I had a hookup. Yeah. I give her the book. I'm like, I really hope you like this. She reads the book overnight. She's like, I love it. I, I you know, I was nervous. She, I'm telling yeah. her some of these things. She loves it. She posted on her story. I'm in this book. And I took great pains to make sure everyone is anonymous. I changed right. names. I changed jobs. So I was like, well, shit. She must feel pretty good about it. Then, like, literally the next day, I see a story of her with Dove at his new factory. And I'm like, oh, shit. She went right to Dove? <gasps> and then the next morning, I got a text from her. How could you do this to me? You you exploited me. You know, these are... Everyone's going to think I'm a traitor. I mean, it's so obvious what happened. Dove got mad. You know, he's like, you told her the geisha story. You told her the geisha story. And he got mad. And now she's very angry. Um, so, But she is still friendly with him mm -hmm. or still seeing or whatever. The, the girl who drove the car up the stairs is, oh, no. I'm, the girl who drove the car up the stairs is still with him. The geisha is still with him. <laughs> So now how old is he? Like 43, 45? He's got to be almost 50 by now, right? Or probably, I'm sure he's over 50. And with these girls that were screwing him, did they like get set up with an apartment and stuff like that? Did they yeah. still have to fold t-shirts? Yeah. I mean, everyone worked. <laughs> like that was the thing. Everyone I worked. I think that's so crazy that when you start screwing the boss, whether oh. you're a paralegal or <laughs> working at this place or... Or Arnold Schwarzenegger's maid. The fact that you still have to, like, do the job that you're hired for a lot, like, <laughs> how so at funny. one point, or so the true. nanny, like, why wouldn't she just be like, uh, yeah. Like, that should be in here. I it's mean, so really, like, I can't believe it. Like, I would think, like, yeah, um, yeah, we're screwing now, and I don't think yeah. I need to be there for the half yearly sale. Yeah. You know? Yes. No, everyone in the cult must work. Even those baldies who were going on the comet, like they had serious jobs every day. The what heavens, baldies? What do you mean? The Heaven's the, Gate. People. Oh, the Heaven's Gate. God, I just talked I, about that the other day because someone so brought up Santa Fe, San Diego. Yeah. And I was like, oh, the Heaven's Gate people yes. with the tennis shoes. They were living in a mansion because they all had to work. They, they must had work to work. Yeah, every they day. were like computer programmers or stuff. Yes, and, they were and then brilliant. that night they're like, we're going to yeah. Heaven's Gate. Yeah. So when, so, so would anybody. I like a cult, start to be like, or even a Playboy Mansion, start to be like, hey, Kate, like, you know what? This is fucking weird. Or getting jealous. Like, don't, if he was dating one girl that you brought in, whatever, that worked there at 19, are they consecutively screwing till she leaves? Or does he, like, find new people and then her feelings are hurt? It's like, what about that? There was very little... Jealousy. There was an understanding. You know, it, it was just like the culture of the company. Like we were encouraged to date our coworkers. You so know, so he never cared if someone had a boyfriend, just oh, as long no. as they were dead. Although well, he would become very jealous if a girl he liked had a boyfriend. That's oh, really? in too. 
Yes. yes. And well, what about if some? What if he did hit on someone and they rejected him and they just wanted to work at the store? Oh, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I've never talked to anybody like that. I mean, you, there were there were never... plenty of us who didn't sleep with him. But did he attempt to? Like, what what was his feeling if he got rejected? Yeah, that's you know, I I I never really witnessed that. Oh well, actually, no. They're in striptease. Um, he became so enamored with this. I mean, she was like 16 years old. She was coming from high school. On, she was like a part-timer. And he l- was so into her. And her boyfriend, who had like braces, he was a teenager. He came into the shop. And Dove became enraged. She took me in the back room. He was like, that 16-year-old girl, she has a 16-year-old brain. Doesn't she know what I could give her? Like, oh, I, I, she brings that boyfriend here. It was like, that was and really- And what did you cr- say to that? Oh, I, well, I didn't say a word because I just, you don't say things to Because you're in the cult. Yeah. But, but you I, I so, thought but it was you, so- but, but at any point were you thinking like, Dove, just legally, she's 16. So like, you're- Yeah. Um, Yes, that's addressed in here too. Yeah, Th- that's at the end when stuff like that started happening. Did he ever actually like get involved with someone who was not eighteen? Um, I mean, my lawyer should probably tell so me not to say this, okay. but, <laughs> but um, I mean, he has a relationship with a junior in high school in the book. Mm-hmm. I try to stay away from the numbers. Right, right, <laughs> right. Okay, so that junior in high school could have been eighteen and a half. She was held back a few years. Yeah. Okay. That that was really when um <laughs> Wow. I, I couldn't put the blinders on anymore. So when did it all explode? Because I only remember like hearing bits and pieces and I, I looked it up a little in which I saw yeah. the ads and stuff b- to prepare for this interview. But tell us a little bit like when how it got exposed and got written about, you know, sure. and everything. Sure. Well, um, it really had about, the company had about 10 good years. Striptease covers the first few, the first year, really, that I worked for the company, although I did work there for three years. Um, you know, his first real, uh, people started finding out about American Apparel and Dove is he, they did a profile on him in Jane Magazine. Okay. And he asked the young Asian journalist, his type, um, if he could masturbate in front of her. And oh, he pulled a Louis C.K.? Yes, oh, how he cute. Did. He did. Well, actually, Louis didn't ask. Right. Dove asked. Louis and... said he did ask. <laughs> Louis said he, yeah. He I was had an ex-boyfriend Louis... who did that to me once. I had seen him in like 10 years. I walk in and he's just like, Louis C.K.'s me. It was so bizarre. <sighs> and he didn't ask. They don't ask. Yeah. No. Although the he did ask the journalist. I think in the Louis C.K. stories, sometimes... He said he asked, and some girl's story said that he asked, and the girls thought it was a joke. Yeah, yes. Because they were like, wait, well, you just finished a set, and we're so excited that we're hanging out because you just saw our funny set, and we actually think you think we're funny. Yes. And, and your only reaction is to laugh when something like that happens. Because you're like, you're so, oh, yeah. you gross old man. Yes. You must be joking. Yes. And I feel so badly for you that you're such a loser exactly. that I'm going to laugh. Yes. And, um... Oh, my God. So he did that, and what happened? Got a ton of amazing press. Because what journalist is going to say, absolutely not. She wrote an amazing story. But she didn't reveal that part, or she oh, did? Oh, no, she did. He also, in, this, in the Jane article? Yes, in the Jane So in the Jane article, she talks about how much she loves the T-shirts, and then says, and at the end, he asked if he could masturbate in front of me, and I chuckled. Oh. Like, how did she write? How did she say it? It's very compelling. I mean, she went to do a profile on him, and she followed him around and went to the factory and was with him with girlfriends and watched girlfriends pleasure him. And um, that's and, that. this is the world we were living in. I know it seems insane, but... And did the author of the Jane article... Because I don't want to look up that article you now. You have to did, read it. Did Her she, name's Claudine Co. and the article is called Meet Your New Boss. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> and, and nobody... And she did not find there was anything problematic or disturbing about what she saw. She just thought all these girls want to do it. Very Manson esque too. Very oh like God, very uh, Charlie Ma- very Manson Charlie. Yes. and very Playboy and yes. this and that and very um, Nexium. Yeah. And so when she was writing this in what year would this have been? Two thousand four, I believe. Um, did any other articles come? After reading this, I mean, like, this is fucking weird. Yes, that okay. that's what, I mean, it's like... But her article wasn't... All press This, this article press. wasn't, this is weird. Well, I it mean, was it was her, weird, but... She wasn't giving an opinion that it was she, weird. It wasn't though. an indictment. Okay. It wasn't like this terrible man. It was like, look at the way this crazy man lives. Okay. He did ask my consent. Um, and the, in fact, the very last line of the article is like, Dove asks me if I want to stick around or, 
you know, go with him. To, and, you know, I kind of think maybe I do. So, like, that's the kind of article it was. It was just a different time. It was a different time we were living in. It was this super sex charge, new millennium, post-AIDS, like... It was fun to be sexy. You know, I think it is such an interesting situation because, you know, I I look at all the different, like, levels of, like, feminism. You know, like, when my mom, totally. my mom graduated from college at the end of the 50s and got married at 1960, but she had a job. She was a copywriter, you know, in oh, Chicago. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and um, she had these all these great stories, like, very mad men, she and my dad. And, um... And then, but then, but at that time, she was like, oh, so then, you know, Bob, my dad, oh, he got a job in Michigan. It was so cold. But then, thank God, he got a job in California. And and I was like, so you were just like, wherever, yeah, she's like, Along wherever Bob ride. wanted to go, you know, yes. like, da-da-da. Mm-hmm. And not until, like, I was, like, maybe five, and I was the youngest of five, so now she'd been, like, a mom for, like, 17 years or whatever. Mm-hmm. Did she start to go, oh, I would like to get back into writing and then realize that wasn't going to make any money. So then she liked real estate. My dad was like, well, you love going to open houses. Why don't you get your real estate license? Yeah. And so she started to work. But then we grew up, the Gen um, Xers, like where it was get, yeah. in our brain that like – to be a housewife is such a bleh, like thing to be. Mm-hmm. You've got to have your education. You've got to have another job. You've got to work. Mm-hmm. And then we have the generation under me that was like, oh, my God, like be Samantha Jones and fuck everybody. <laughs> like why? Why even bother? <laughs> and so like I'm watching this. I'm already married when the show comes out or something. And I'm like. God, did I miss out? No. But I also had a lot of friends. I'm like, nobody was this slutty. And I realize it's written by gay men and stuff. But, like, I feel like the the 15-year-old girls that were watching Sex in the City about women who were 32 and boning after a gym without taking a shower, I think it did influence them strongly along with all this other stuff and the girls next door and oh, th- all of that. Mm-hmm. And then they kind of, like, are like, oh, well, now I'm – you know, not married or whatever. And now there's this younger generation of like Gen Z that are actually like, you got to get married when you're young because the 30 year olds can't find any good men. Mm-hmm. So like lock it down with the first nice guy you meet in college, the complete opposite oh gosh, of what so people were told my age. Yeah. Like, oh my God, you don't want to marry the guy you were pinned to in college. Are you yeah. fucking kidding? No, you want to party, 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 then find him like around 29 Yes. Get married by 30 and then pop out, you know. Yes. And then the next generation was like, no, you don't want to get married at 29. You want to party, party, party. And then around 35, panic, freeze your eggs. And now it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you nailed it. Just. <laughs> and then also there's a big thing I see with a lot of Gen Z young women that are flexing like, I don't have to work. My man pumps my gas, pays my bills. And there's people like mm-hmm. that are like, yeah, why did our moms ruin it for us? Like, all my mom had to do was, like, make sure that there was, like, a tuna casserole in the oven at the mm-hmm. end. I'm like, if all I had to do was a tuna casserole, even if I, <laughs> like, then, it, like, maybe my life would be easier. Yes. But it's just, it is just a really, I love, like, talking about that kind of stuff and how, Me like, too. attitudes change. And as women, you can you can make those decisions and you shouldn't be forced to feel like you have to, you know be super sexy or, you know, be bisexual if you want to. But if you don't, you don't have to either. Like, I always feel like there was a, mm-hmm. a moment where, like, why are you this cis straight female? Like, no, you could be that. You could also be bi. You could also be whatever. But you can also, like, it shouldn't, you know, a lot of these women are, like, seeing that, oh, it's great. Like, if I just want to be a mom, like, yeah. that isn't, like, a loser thing that, like, you know, because there was that moment when Hillary Clinton was, like, I wasn't just home baking cookies. Oh, yeah. Because she wasn't. Yeah. No. And she was like, uh, I went to law school. I'm a lawyer. Like, I want my props. Yes. But at the same time, it's just crazy. Yeah. It's very interesting. So so then when this article came out and the girl's like, and I just might. <laughs> so then were people starting to say, what the hell is this situation? Were enough people questioning it? Um, I, We just got tremendous press from it. Like, all press is good press. And yeah. I, I think once he realized that, he could really sort of dig into that perviness as his brand. Oh. The ads became dirtier. You know, um, it was um, that 
that Jane article really was a catalyst, I think, for for the company. But we would, you know, sometimes we would get flyer bombed. There's a flyer bombing in strip tees where they, you know, some gorilla wheat pasters after that Jane article came out, pasted the store over with flyers that said, obey your master bader. Kind of clever. Yeah. Um, so things like that would happen. In fact, there's a photo insert in here and one of those flyers is in there. Um, wow. But yeah, no, I, he got a lot of mileage out of that. And, you know, that soon he was on 2020 and soon the New York Times was writing about him and business was just totally booming. And you're still working there at that time. Oh, yeah. So then what, what happens? Um, then, so after the events of Miami, which is sort of where I, the climax of this book, where I really okay. sort of come to terms, um, I try to leave. Mm -hmm. I, I go to Betsy Johnson. I, I, I think, oh, my gosh, I've been hiring for American Apparel. Like, who, they're all going to want me. Nobody wanted me. They were like, oh, American Apparel, are you one of the girlfriends? Like, that was the, I mean, they oh, wouldn't say in that. in the but fashion industry. Yeah, yeah, like, even in the fashion industry, we were sort of marked. Um, I ended up going to what I thought, which this is one of my favorite stories in striptease. It's called the Emperor's Club. I, I answered this Craigslist ad. I was desperate. I was looking for a new job. I really wanted to get out of American Apparel. People were like, yeah. why did you stay? I tried. I, I knew shit was I hairy. know. I hate it when people, when Like, I need a paycheck. I know. I, I hate it paycheck. when people are like, if you didn't like it. Yeah. Why don't you just quit? Yeah. I'm like, and I'm do, sorry. You yeah. have a job. You know where to park. You know how to do it. You work with all your friends. Yeah. Like, that it's a big life. deal to leave a position until you have another one lined up, yes. which that's also hard to do. Yeah. Sneak around and go on job, you know, yes. interviews and stuff. But anyway, go on. I, so I land one that I think is going to be amazing. It's at this fancy hotel off the strip. I go in. It's like a strange older man and a young woman. And I thought it was for a head hunting position. No, it was like a high class hooker ring. <laughs> and they So wait, you walk in and what do they say? Well, first, they're they're all talking in circles. They're like, We know that you applied for the headhunter position, but now that you're here, perhaps you'd like to be a spokesmodel. And I was like, spokesmodel? What does that mean? And they kept wanting me to go to their hotel room. At least I knew enough to be like, oh, let's stay in the lobby. I always did my interviews in the lobby. You said your friend did interviews yeah. in their hotel. like that. So that, I didn't think anything of that. Right, right. Um, and I, I kept saying, like, but what is the job? Like, what, what is it for? What company is it for? Headhunting? For what? Spokesmodel. And then they started putting out pieces of paper on the table. And one was a map of the world. And it was in, like, segments. And then... There was, like, another page with categories on it. It would say, like, business, music, politics, sports. They were like, you know, you're a smart girl. I had my resume and my cover letter. They were like, you could meet a lot of people that, you know, would be really – that would really appreciate your, your smarts, you know, your worldliness. And then they brought out another paper with diamonds on it and dollar amounts. And I stupidly was like, oh, my God, the one job I found – is, is uh, to be a high class hooker, <laughs> which you know I, I respect so sex workers, say? but it just wasn't for me. Yeah, um, I I was so embarrassed, just like I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, I I didn't know what this was. And the woman said to me, "What did you think it was?" You know, but it really was sort of a, a trick. They knew I didn't know what I was going in for because you know those are the kind of girls they want. They, they want, want the, college girls. The, yeah, girl next door, the smart, the clean, the classy. Yes. You know, it's like. But with anything like that, whether it's that or a, you get a job and then you realize it's because you are hot or sexually harassed, and people are like, oh, God, again, go get a job. I'm like, you know, it's just so disheartening as a woman. And I know this happens with men, too, now. Because it's like you thought you got hired or got the interview because, you you know, you're so fabulous. You're so smart. Mm -hmm. You're so engaging. You, you know, and then you realize... Oh, you dumb girl, you. Yes. And that's what's like so. That's striptease. That is what's like so heartbreaking to people. And it really just crushes like your spirit and your mm -hmm. trust in humanity and your trust in yourself and your trust in your abilities. Mm -hmm. And that's like the worst part about any kind of sexual harassment or what happened with you of like, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, totally. I remember I had situations like that, especially with like acting and stuff. Oh. Definitely. And like, like yes. I have so many awful oh stories, but I, like, yeah. Yes, you should write a book about those. I have some of them in my thing, and then sometimes they come up, and I'm like, oh my God, you dumb girl. Like, yeah, yeah yes. I'm doing this one thing, and they go, okay, if you want to do this other movie, and they hand me this script, 
and it's like this girl's putting on suntan lotion on another girl's like open like she has her top on and I go Hmm. I go is this a porn and they're like what are you you think you're you I remember the girl goes what you think Michelle Pfeiffer didn't do porn before (laughs) Grease 2 and I'm like well, I don't know, but I don't think I have to do porn. Like, yeah. I'm not broke, broke. Like, I have a Toyota Celica, and I can drive it home to my parents' house in Woodland Hills and, like, have shelter. Yes. But I understand that yes, people can. Yes, exactly. Yes. Like, because I grew up here, I always had that, you know, that solid ground that you don't have when you come from another place. And they probably seek out people like that. Absolutely. You know, that are yes. that, that are going to be desperate to stay yes. working. Yes. You, you know, because they don't have like a parent's house to go home to. It's yeah. Very true. In the town. It's very true. It, in fact, after the Emperor's Club meeting, so I went back to look at the Craigslist ad and I see there was a little URL, Emperor's Club. I'm like, oh, if I'd only clicked. You know, yeah. I was applying for jobs left and right. I was like, not, didn't do my due diligence. But a few years after that, I was watching the news and who do I see? But the little man and the young woman, because Elliot Spitzer, the governor of New York, was with an Emperor's Club girl. That's how he got busted. So I was like, oh my God. Wait, Elliot Spitzer was with... He got, he was using funds to pay for an Emperor's Club girl. And And that girl, you know, that girl went on to marry this guy and his daughter is Alex Earl, the biggest, hottest new TikTok person. No, She is the stepmother of Alex Earl. You could have been, you could have been <laughs> the stepmother of Alex Earl. I could have. That could have been me. I could be like, how's Alex? Yeah. Isn't that funny? That is so funny. That the is way, so funny. like, yeah, you could, you would not be sitting here today. You're living a nice life. That, she right. has a nice life. Yes, I'm sure. The, the, the Alex Earl dad is hot. That is too I'm pretty funny. sure he was still married when they met. So she, she embraced that stepmother embraced the press that she got from yeah. that Elliot Spitzer stuff. You have to. Something yeah. Like that. And it all worked out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then what, so what happened? Like, where is he now? Were there lawsuits? Oh, yes. There were So plenty. who was suing? And the, really, that's kind of what tanked the company. Girls oh, yeah. that worked for him. So who finally was the first, like, whistleblower? And was it like a class action or each person got oh, their yeah. own person and was Gloria Allred called at yes, any point? Yes, Gloria Allred was okay. called right there, right in the beginning when I was there. Gloria Allred represented two of them. And there I was cheering on the opposite side. You're like, the these most lying attorney. girls. Yeah, well, I was yeah. like, the lawsuits were, there's hustlers on the walls. They use dirty language. It wasn't like Doug oh. tried to have sex with me. It was like, we're in a hostile environment. Got it. And so for my feminism did she, of the day. Did, she, did those girls settle for money? Yes. Okay. And you have any, any yeah. idea how much? Um, well, actually, uh, I shouldn't say that. Some, I'm not sure about those specifically. Yeah. Some were certainly ended in settlements. I, okay. I think most were. Uh, some of those, which I talk about in striptease, were thrown out. And yeah. he was jubilant. Um, so, you know, sometimes the law was on his side. But that is really ultimately what tanked the company. All so, the money So some of lawsuits. these girls that were the girlfriends... Mm-hmm. Who carried on for years, boning and folding T-shirts. Yeah, none of them have filed sexual harassment lawsuits. So, so who? So was it? Was it anybody that actually had sex with him on a regular basis? But because they were an employee, they had a right to sue. Well, when I, um, I think that I left the company. Um, but later on, the claims really got very uh, lascivious, and you know there were people that did say stuff like that. But that wasn't like my era of the company. Um, the one, the lawsuits that I talk about in striptease, no, none of the women had slept with him. Yeah. So that's why it was easy to brush it off. Like you know, he would say, "These are opportunists. They're coming for our money." You know, yeah. like yes, I wear my underwear here. We design underwear. Yeah, you know, yes, I use foul language. This is right. the fashion industry. Like. This is how it is. Yeah. And it, and that's true. Too, that is about the fashion industry because yeah. I um, interviewed and read um, this Real Housewives of New Jersey, Margaret. Yeah. She wrote a great book and she was really honest about how like she worked in fashion mm-hmm. and she's like 55 or something. So this is when she's like in her 20s. And she's like, there was so much like sleeping with your boss and mm-hmm. like she went and something happened where she – didn't really know it was going to happen, but then it did happen. And she was like, okay, I guess this is happening. And was just like very yeah. honest about it now. And obviously in retrospect, you know, but it's just like, and yes. again, I was like, and you still had to work. Like I just, yes, ugh. Like even in my day, you would meet like some gorgeous Russian models and they'd be like, they're there in a, you know, in an apartment, like 
these men invite us to go on boat? Like, no, don't go on the boat. Like, do not go on the boat. It's just like almost part of the job. Like you're a, a Hollywood chorus girl in the 20s. Yeah. You know? Well, I know that too with the modeling thing, especially in the 80s, like in Paris I mean, and I stuff, should... that, uh, yeah, they got sucked in mm-hmm. to a lot of that, you know, Definitely. which today would be considered trafficking 100%. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so where... Is everything now with the company and this guy? Yes. So American Apparel met its end around 2015. Investors kicked out Dove, but really without Dove at the helm, you know, it really couldn't support himself. You know, he, it couldn't support, it couldn't support itself. Um, so it doesn't exist anymore. No. You know what happened? Gildan. You know, they're like a huge sweatshop made t-shirt. Like if you buy a concert t-shirt, it's like okay. Gildan in the back. They bought the intellectual property. And okay. so you can go to American Apparel dot whatever and buy some like crappy reproduction that's made in a sweatshop. Okay. Um, so that's where the name is, American Apparel. Okay. He's doing it again. I mean, he's he's gone bankrupt before. He thinks he'll do it again. It, his new company is Los Angeles Apparel. They have a factory downtown. He's working with Kanye. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So I think he's ready for for. Or so any of those lawsuits and everything, they were all just civil and they were settled or thrown out. Um, nothing was ever criminal. No, no, uh, no, no, nothing. No. So it's all he said, she said. Kind yes, of stuff. yes, yes. And you know who was happily part of the harem and yes. who wasn't. Well, one of the lawsuits that I heard about this is very at the very end. She was like. I was his sex slave and I was locked in a room and I want to be like, I, I know the sex, I know the sex slave, the geisha, and she's not locked in a room. Like, that's not how they operated. But then again, you know, I had been with the company with for years and power and money can warp a lot of people very quickly. So, you know, I don't know. But when I was there, um, those lawsuit girls didn't seem like their claims held much water to me. Yeah. At the yeah. Time. Well, um, Tell everybody where they can follow you and get the book. Oh, yes. Um, I'm on Instagram, Kate C. Flannery. You can get the book anywhere. I re- recommend going to an indie bookstore, of course. Yes. But go if to you... Book Soup and yes. get a cute lunch. Totally. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, it's at Barnes & Noble. It's it's Amazon. It's everywhere. And you did an audio version. Yes, For the I people did. that like to listen to yes. audio books. Yes, yeah. I'm very proud of the audio version. That, that's a good one. Yeah, I think so it, I, I could see how it could make a great audio. Just even the way you write the description... Like, I can see the bar. I can see the store. Like, it's kind of, it's one of those things that, that I think would work great for audio, well, too. thank you. Thank yes. You. And, um, well, thank you so much for coming. This was great. Everybody get the book. It's a good summer read. It's a cute cover. And um, you have, you know, great quotes. And, yeah. Thank juicy, you juicy. Very much. Thank you. It is a juicy read. It Thanks. is a juicy read. Thank you so much for having me. This yeah, was such ab- fun. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Bye. Bye.